when we go to the store, it's got more food than ever before. The health food store, the health food supermarkets are loaded with fruits from around the world. It's very hard for people to really take to heart that climate change could cause food shortages, um, especially in the developed world. What's your perspective of how close are we possibly to having any type of food shortages because of climate change? Is that something you consider a real and present threat, or is that something you consider far into the future? I'm happy to start. Um, so let me just say something real quickly about water shortages and, and why they come out, come about. Um, they're really the result of a supply and demand problem. So anytime your demand or your consumption of something, your personal bank account, the, the, your withdrawals, once they get to be as large as the deposits, you've got a serious problem. And so there are some crops like tomatoes and rice and uh, a number of other really, really common foods that we eat that are currently being produced in places that have serious water shortage problems, okay? Um, another way to make that point is that about 20% of all of our food is being grown using water from groundwater aquifers that are rapidly declining. So, it's, it's, so at least, if you can just start out, 20% of our food production is unsustainable under current practices. Um, and a lot of the rest of it is vulnerable. It's, it doesn't mean that we, they go out of production every year, but we're getting these repeated shocks. Every time there's a little bit less water available, a little bit less supply, the agricultural demand isn't being satisfied, and so you have a shock. So every time we get these, what, what a drought does, you know, the media likes to say that droughts cause water shortages or that droughts cause water crisis. They're not looking at that equation, at the balance. Yes, it's causing less supply to be available, but it's the fact that our demand is so great that makes us so vulnerable. You asked the question, I'm gonna follow on from Brian, about, say, the food in the US. Now, for me, food availability is about purchasing power. So the problem is that when we have these food shocks, so one of the classic ones was the huge heat wave that occurred in 2010 in Moscow. It's called the Moscow heat wave, but it affected most of northern Russia. And that affected their wheat, and therefore they banned the export of wheat to try and protect their wheat for their own country. That had a huge knock-on effect to other countries who were used to importing wheat. Now, in the US and Europe, if, we, if our bread goes up by 60%, you might whine about it, you might complain about it, but actually it is not a huge cost. Your food is a relatively small percentage of your, day, your sort of weekly uh, sort of outgoings. Whereas in many countries, most of the money that people earn goes directly on food to feed themselves and their family. So a 60% increase in other countries is actually quite frightening. And so I think the problem is that we in the West will never really feel that sort of uh, food shock because, again, we are able to actually buy the food which actually perhaps should be going elsewhere. And again, what we're doing is by opening up all the world trade is stopping countries from protecting their own food sources because we want to sell food in there, but we also want to take their food and actually bring it to ourselves. So it's a really complicated problem, which is as climate change starts to really affect certain countries, if they don't have inherent wealth or historic wealth, they're going to have problems being able to buy in food to actually maintain their sort of like uh, population. So, so that brings to a question, this is actually something I would last, like to ask the panel because I, I've raised it and I can't get a, um, a cogent response and that is, you know, we, we, the rainfall may be diminished in one area, but in other areas, it seems that there's a lot of rainfall. And the question is, if you integrate over the entire Earth the amount of rainfall per week or per month or whatever, is it constant or is it not constant? And I haven't been able to get an answer from people who I would, 
would have thought could provide that answer. I wonder if anybody knows the answer to that. Okay, so when we've done uh, climate models for the next 100 years, what we see is that there is perhaps a small drop in the total rain, uh, sorry, a small increase in the total rainfall, maybe about 1% over the whole planet, okay, which isn't really significant. What we see is that the rainfall is actually coming in shorter, more intense bursts. So we go from a situation of having perhaps more distributed rainfall during the year in uh, areas around the world, and we go to more intense storms and rainfall, which again, interestingly enough, you have to adapt to because you have to have different ways of storing that water. Again, as uh, a child growing up in London and going on holidays in England, I can tell you that uh, sort of uh, in the 70s, uh, August was the wettest month in England, okay? I can remember dreadful holidays with grey, drizzly rain throughout the summer. Guess what? That doesn't happen anymore because we've started to move to a more Mediterranean-type climate, so we're getting hotter, drier summers and wetter, warmer winter. So we're already moving to that seasonality. So again, no, the total water doesn't change that much, but the way it arrives and where it arrives changes. Now, if we were a completely uh, connected society globally, and we went, oh, hang on, we now know that this area is too dry to uh, uh, make food or uh, have wheat. We'll move it over to this place where we know water is available and freely available. We're going to plant wheat there and make sure it's distributed. We can do that. That would be fantastic. But we don't. We have a system of nation states and we have different wealth levels. And so therefore, we have an incredibly complicated political viewpoint and landscape, which actually causes problems when we're trying to distribute food around the world. I hear you. If I understood correctly, you're talking about models for the future. I'm just wondering if there's any evidence from the past of actual rainfall measurements that could speak to the question that I asked. Right. So um, there were two studies uh, published in uh, Nature uh, about five to six years ago, which I can dig out for you. And what they did was they actually took all the records uh, of rainfall and showed that over the last 60 years, and it's only for the northern hemisphere, unfortunately, because the coverage isn't as good in the southern hemisphere. And what they showed was that the amount of intense rainfall events had increased markedly over the 60 years, even though the total rainfall hadn't actually changed that much. Okay. And that's probably because there is the, the equilibrium between the moistening of the troposphere, where more than 90% of the water vapor is contained in the atmosphere. And, and water vapor is the single largest greenhouse gas, comprising mm -hmm. more than 90% by volume of greenhouse gases. And so that equilibrium is reached within a matter of days between moistening up the troposphere mm -hmm. and global average temperature. And the physics tells us that a one degree Celsius temperature rise of the planet leads to 7% more moisture in the troposphere. Warm air holds more water than yep. cold air does. And that's one of the reasons we're getting these super storms and mm -hmm. brand new terminology invented, like rain bombs. Mm -hmm. You never heard of a rain bomb until the media brought it up this year. <laughs> right? There was no such thing. <laughs> so we inv invent new terms to describe these phenomena that previously didn't exist because there's more water in the atmosphere than there used to be, and what goes up must come down. Don't you think, don't you think the sun's activity has something to do with this? Solar radiance has declined since the early 1980s. Yeah. So the amount of incoming radiation has declined while global average temperature has increased. So you're both right. So before um, anybody says that solar radiation doesn't affect climate, you will see that if you look at the temperature record for the last 150 years, it goes up. But you can see that there are beautiful decadal cycles in there which are related to things like the sunspot, the North Atlantic Oscillation. So there are variations, but when you actually strip those all out, those all average out, and actually the long-term trend, and again, uh, people were saying, oh, we've got a hiatus in the warming. Yeah, 19, uh, 2015 was the warmest year on record. And actually, your uh, um, guy's absolutely right. The solar radiation has been dropping off for the last 10 years, 
and it will hit a minimum, and then it's going to come back up. And the problem is that we've been warming strongly for those from, uh, years. And one of the fears that uh, scientists have is, as the solar radiation comes back up to average, and we're still, the warming's going to actually increase markedly, because at the moment, the sun's actually slightly helping us against our sort of like, climate change.